Welcome to Classic Valley Investors. My name is Mariusz Skonieczny, and today with me I have a guest, special guest, uh, Jay Mensmeyer, who is, I would say, a, a shipping specialist. Uh, so, uh, Jay, thanks for joining me. Marius, thanks. I appreciate the invite. I'm excited to come here and uh, talk about some of the stuff we've been seeing in the markets. Yeah, so uh, I've been reading about your work. I'm pretty impressed with your work on the oil tankers. Um, can you can you tell my audience a little bit about how you got involved in it? Because you, you're very much specialized on the sector. So can you just give us a little bit of color how you um, you know came to what you are today? Yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I've been writing on Seeking Alpha and been involved in the markets for a little over 10 years now. And, you know, we, we got involved in Seeking Alpha because it was sort of an open source. Uh, it started off as sort of like an open source blog slash community, right, where people could just come on and share investment ideas and, and stuff like that. And so I got very involved. I was always sort of a, a value or deep value investor. And, and then as I started to experiment a little bit more in the markets, I, I realized that if you want to have sustained outperformance in the market, uh, you need to specialize on a specific area. And so at first I wasn't sure what that area would be, um, but I kind of became attracted to shipping companies because I realized that these companies are very cyclical and volatile and they often disconnect completely from fundamentals. So, you know, I, a few years ago I launched a service called Value Investors Edge. We're actually coming up on our five year anniversary and that's hosted on Seeking Alpha. So I have about 13,000 followers on Seeking Alpha and that's, you know, for the free content and for the blogs and whatnot. And then I have a little over 500 paid members on Value Investors Edge and those are folks who sign up to receive the advanced analytics and earnings previews and reviews and, and that sort of thing. Mm, I see, I see. So, uh, you know, the... Um the situation that's going on in the oil tankers market um, just can you give give us a little bit overview just in case some people who are listening to it are new of what's happening in that space yeah no absolutely so what's really happening in the oil tanker markets is, is unprecedented I you know I was just speaking with the CEO of frontline a couple days ago we had him on our service for a live with our members and I was asking him you know because he's been in the industry for about 15 or 20 years and I said hey have you ever seen something like this and he said, no, I, I haven't either. And as a matter of fact, he was speaking with the chairman of Frontline, who is John Fredrickson, who is, is very well known across Norway as being probably the most influential person alive today in shipping. And even John Fredrickson had said this was something that's totally unprecedented. Normally, shipping rates are determined by demand versus supply, like any other market. And the supply is just the vessels on the water, and the demand is expressed in ton miles. How many cargoes do you have and, and where do you need to place them? So, for example, you know, Saudi Arabia is exporting to China or, you know, Iran is exporting to India or the United States is now exporting to Korea. Things like that drive that sort of oil demand. Well, today's market is, is almost like inverse in the sense that we have a complete demand destruction for crude oil, but that means we have to store the excess. So we have an oversupply, global oversupply. It, estimates range. It's hard to nail this down because global uh, oil data is trailing, and it trails by about six to eight weeks. And even then, even at six weeks, it's still estimates. Uh, but the, the shortfall estimate is somewhere between 15 and 25 million barrels per day. And global oil storage is already – almost near tops because of the huge build that we had in 15 and 16. And, and we hadn't really worked a lot of that down. So the oil storage was already quite high coming into this. And then the coronavirus destroyed all the demand for oil, right? It's, it's going to be temporary, but it destroyed all the demand for oil. And now folks are scrambling. They're saying, where are we going to put this oil? And, when, uh, and, and we saw this. The, uh, oh, go ahead. When you said that um, the, the storage was um, you know, already kind of full from prior years, you, you mean the land storage, right? That's correct. So the land storage was already so so high that when we got hit with this glut of oil, I mean, you saw it the other day that WTI, I know it was kind of a paper fragment, but the WTI actually went negative for a little bit. I mean, there's a there's a panic out there looking for storage. So the only place they can put this oil is essentially on ships. So what we're seeing in the markets, we're seeing basically all time record highs for rates because oil traders and big oil and governments are almost in a panic where they don't know where to put this oil and they're just hiring whatever they can find. Why can't? Why is it so difficult to just turn turn the production off? Well, you know, there's a lot of it's it's in the many ways in fracking, especially in the United States with shale oil. Uh, if you shut in those wells, sometimes that's a permanent process. 
it can destroy some of the, the caverns and, and whatnot that have developed. So that it's kind of a one-way process. So they don't want to shut those in unless they're absolutely certain uh, that they're not going to come back to that site again. Because it would just it would make it uneconomic to restart. So that's the problem in the United States. Uh, going globally, um, there's just a lot of logistics to it. It's not as simple as you know flipping a switch or turning a lever or you know it's not like a valve on a on a fire hydrant, right? You can't just turn it off. So I'm not a super uh, I'm not an oil specialist myself. I actually subscribe to other services that cover that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't want to get too much into the nuances. Right. Uh, but it actually. But the point being is that it actually costs money to shut in the wells. It's not just like turning off a garden. It's it's more like an overflowing toilet right now. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good uh, metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, th these companies, because uh, you know there is a huge demand for for storage, these companies are able to charge um, you know unprecedented rates that no one in the industry have seen before. Yet the stock prices don't really reflect that which is a tremendous disconnect why, why, why do you think that uh, such a disconnect exists I think investors are skeptical and I understand that look I mean shipping has been a tough area to invest in um, for the last 10 or 12 years and and we've just I would say we've exited the bull market. I'm, I'm kind of bearish on the economy I, I think that's you know my personal take but regardless we've had a 11 year bull run. Right. I mean, we, we've had a, just a phenomenal global market and a lot of these shipping companies have failed to make money consistently over the last 11 years. So investors say, well, if shipping can't make money during like one of the greatest bull markets of all time, uh, then how are they going to do heading into maybe a global recession? So that that is sort of like that broad picture, you know, kind of knee jerk reaction. Uh, but that kind of ignores the fact that shipping has its own set of supply and demand. And look, shipping was super oversupplied uh, in 2008, 2009. The order book was something on the order of 50, 55 percent of the entire fleet was in new builds, right? So it was super oversupplied, and it took about seven or eight or nine years to work off that excess supply. So we're sitting at one of the most bullish uh, fleet balances we've ever seen. And I was actually bullish on tankers uh, starting in 2019 was when I really got bullish because I said, look, the supply of the fleet is so tight. We have the oldest fleet we've ever had. We have the smallest number of order uh, ships on order book that we've ever had. All it takes is one little spark and rates are going to go ballistic. And, and look what happened last fall. We, we had the Costco sanction. Remember those? Uh, the rates went ballistic for a couple months, right? And, you know, the rates went ballistic, but it was only for a couple months. So I think investors are both skeptical because of the long term. You know, it's, it's been difficult to be a shipping investor. And they also saw what happened with Costco where it was like two months. So I think a lot of investors think, oh, yeah, rates are ballistic. But, you know, shipping stinks. It's a tough sector and it's only going to last for two months. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, but you know, over the last couple of days, there have been a tremendous, tremendous, uh, you know, uh, exposure to the oil uh, oil tankers. Uh, I mean, uh, there were some interviews on CNBC, uh, and I'm sure you've seen that. Um, yeah, so it seems to me like the the the, the retail investors are getting interested, uh, but. Um, you know, not not so much the institutional investors. What's your thought on that? Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of funny because shipping is one of the sectors where it's almost the inverse of every other main sector. If you have something like tech or bio uh, bio stocks or something like that, you usually have these institutions that come in and they do the initial funding, right, the venture capital and whatnot for a company, and then they take it public, and the retail is sort of like the last one in, right? The retail is sort of like the quote unquote dumb money. Right, that drives up the, the margins and the institutions sort of like dump it to the unsuspecting retail. Right, that's how most markets work. In shipping, it's a little bit inverse because a lot of these companies are so small that these large funds, these large institutions aren't really interested in it during the normal course of time. So it's folks like myself who have a niche research service who dive into these companies and really have an understanding for them. And it's retail folks, uh, you know, like yourself, like myself, who, you know, are on Seeking Alpha or on Value Investors Edge or whatever service it might be, who are very into these stocks and really understand them. And then when the cycle runs up and things get overvalued, we kind of understand that because we've been following the stocks and the institutions are like the last ones in. So shipping is like totally on its head where the institutions are usually kind of like, I hate to say this, but kind of like the dumb money. Right. You, you know, um, just s six weeks ago, uh, when they had the the 14th annual shipping conference by Capital Link, 
I was listening to the CEOs and, and analysts, and the CEOs were, 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 were bullish, but they were cautiously bullish. And now they are a little bit more bullish, but the analysts, uh, especially one particular analyst, uh, just downgraded the sector. Uh, have you seen that? Um, just so we're talking about the same analyst, are you talking about uh, Joachim Hannestall of Cleves, or are you yes, talking about yes, someone yes, else? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you know, I did see that. And, you know, I think there's a matter of I, I respect his work. He, he's highly uh, data oriented. He uses a lot of models. Uh, but I think there's a time where uh, sometimes common sense uh, should trump, uh, you, you know, your, your knee jerk reaction to things. And I think Joakim, what he did was he said, look, we're going to have a surge in rates for two or three or four months. Right. He admits he doesn't know how long it's going to last. But I think he said recently it's going to be two, three, four months somewhere in there. And then he says, well, it's going to be really bad on the other side. And I don't necessarily disagree with, with Joakim. I, I respect him highly. But I think what you have to do is you have to model in all those cash flows that you're going to make in three or four months or five months or whatever period of time it is. And then you have to model a terminal valuation for what happens if rates come back down. And that's what we've done on our service. We've actually ran all of our companies, all of our investments through a variety of scenarios, and we stress tested them. We stress tested the balance sheets, we stress tested the cash flows, and so on. And we've actually identified a couple stocks uh, where even in like extreme stress, there's still upside from today's prices. Yeah, so, um, okay, so right now we are in a situation where everyone is on a lockdown, so obviously we're not driving our cars, not not flying anywhere. So yes, the, the, there's a huge de demand destruction. And as a result of this, uh, the extra oil has to be stored somewhere, and this creates uh, this... Um, uh, demand for uh, for for the vessels, where you, usually the vessels are used for, for for moving oil, but now they are used for moving oil as well as the storage. But let's say, you know, in a month from now, uh, they let us go, and a bunch of those vessels are stuck uh, in the ocean for the next six or twelve months, storing the oil. So. Like, how do you see the demand playing out in that kind of scenario? So you're, you're absolutely right that it's a balance between how many ships are using uh, – how many ships are doing like the conventional trans – and, and how many ships are, you know, just storing the oil. So, you know, in a scenario where, you know, the storage stops building up, you're, you're also going to have a decline in demand for transport. And I think that is sort of the bearish angle on this thing is that, look, on the other side of the hill – Right, we're, we're climbing the hill. And in this case, the hill is a good thing, right? The hill is like the, the demand for storage and transport. Right. And we're, we're climbing that hill, and the higher we get up that hill, the higher and higher and higher the rates go, right? But at some point, we're going to crest that hill, right? And we're going to come back down on the other side. And I think it's going to be like, you, you see some of those, uh, I think they're like mountains in like Peru or whatever, where they're like little spires that go into the sky, right? Like there's, there's not much of a plateau, and they just like plummet on the other side. Um, that's probably going to be kind of how the rates go. Uh, because look, right now the rates are like 150, 200, 250 thousand. Um, even the most bullish folks, I don't think expect 150, 200, 250 to last indefinitely or or even for a long period of time. Uh, because look, Marius, I, I think there's a misunderstanding sometimes of what a normal rate is. A normal rate in April or May is like twenty thousand dollars a day. Uh, so we're not making, you know, we're we're not making just high profits. We're making absolutely insane, absurd. Insert, you know. 10 more object uh, adjectives in there, right? These rates are off the charts. And la last point I'm going to make on that is that most of the profit break-ins, evens for these companies, cash flow break-even is usually about 15,000 a day. Uh, profit in terms of like gap EPS is usually about 25,000 a day. So if a normal rate is like 30,000 or 25,000, the cash flow is like maybe 10,000 a day. And the earnings is like maybe 5,000 a day. So it, you know, I'm getting a little bit too much in math here. I need to bust up my calculator. But if you do 150,000, right, and you're taking off, you know, 25,000 for cash flow, you're at one tw or for earnings, you're at $125,000 per day of earnings compared to normally 5,000. That's 25 times the amount of daily earnings is what we're doing in this market. So it's just it's just off the mark. So I, I don't want folks to lose sight of that. Um, if rates do come off, that you need to understand how far above they are from normal. So like like what I'm saying is like a drop from like 200 to like 120 um, would not even be a bad thing at all. Right, right. But but let's say um, let's say you know in six weeks from now uh, we are allowed to go out. Uh, not not I I don't see personally I don't see the demand to go back up to the same level that it was initially. I think it's going to take some time for people to 
to get comfortable with flying and uh, going out and a lot of people are out of work so they have to get jobs to get back to driving so I think that yes the demand for oil will be higher than what it is right now because we're not doing anything right now uh, but it's not going to be to the same level that it was before uh, but even with that demand and let's say 20 or 30 percent of the fleet being stock storing oil I still think that the rates maybe they won't be as high as they are today but they're still probably going to be higher than 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 the average over the last you know five years yeah you know I think that makes sense and one of the things that I do I, I subscribe to other services that model the oil markets and discuss energy and I try to stay in my lane but one of the things I do look at is I look at the reports from like Rystad, IEA, uh, EIA which is the United States version of the of the energy information uh, of agency and, and you know I look at these uh, you know different reports and I see if there's you know I use some common sense and say does this make sense and all the reports I was looking at about a month ago like late March start of April they all showed this like ridiculous v-shaped recovery in demand right right it was like well demand's gonna be terrible in April but in May it's gonna be like magical and like you know and, and we're gonna see demand snap right back up and everyone's gonna be hopping on airplanes and cruise ships and it just was not realistic at all so I, I think we're in agreement there that as these forecasts get updated, and they're already starting to get updated, right? If you look at one today, it's totally different. But they're already starting to get updated. The estimates for uh, May and June, the demand estimates have been plummeting. Now, of course, that's offset by the OPEC plus cuts. Uh, I don't think OPEC plus cut enough. I don't even think they cut half as much as they needed to cut. Um, but that is getting offset slightly. So I think the peak of the frenzy is basically like right now. Uh, I think May is also going to be a really brutal mar uh, market for the oil people. I think in June and July, we start to normalize a little bit more. Uh, but you're, you're right. I mean, the rates could still be stronger in, in June and July. Um, I just want to, you know, I, I just want to caution folks, first of all, um, that, you know, the, the gigantic rates, like I'm talking 150, 200, 250, uh, those are a short term phenomenon, right? Yeah. But I also want folks to understand that if rates come back to like, you know, 100 or something like that, or even if they come back to like 75 or 80, that is still a very, very strong rate. Right. So right now we have on the range of investors, we, we have some people that obviously are extremely bullish. And then we have someone like Copy who is on the other uh, spectrum who is, uh, you know, extremely bullish. I just wanted to get your take on it because he, you know, he thinks that we, we can be in this high rate environment, not necessarily this high, but high rate environment for maybe, you know, two to three years. What uh, I don't I don't think you're that bullish on this. Am I right? Yeah, you know, I, I look at I model all the scenarios, right? And I, what I do is I model in a bullish scenario, maybe more like a baseline scenario, and then I do bearish and stress testing and that. And I, I come to my fair value estimates based on an average of those scenarios. Right. So I think what Cuppy is doing and, and Cuppy does great work, but I, th I think Cuppy, you know, is simplifying it for folks. And, and that's OK as long as people understand the assumptions. I think what Cuppy is doing is he's saying what could happen. Right. And it could happen. And he's saying the bullish case. Right. He's saying if this bullish case happens, then these stocks have, you know, 300, 400, 500 percent upside. Right. They're multi baggers. But he's he's showing you the bullish case. And there's nothing wrong with showing you the bullish case. It could definitely happen. But what we do in our service is we we do the bullish, we do the baseline, we do a the stress test, and then we sort of average those out, and we come to sort of a weighted price target or price estimate, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think our estimates are lower, probably much lower than Cuppies. But look, I mean, my average upside, I'll give you a, I'll give you three companies that, and we're long all three of these. So just for disclosures, but I'll give you three companies in the oil tanker sector we like and explain kind of the weighted upside on them. So the first one is Diamond S, DSSI. This one's often misunderstood. It's it's 50% Suez Maxes. So Suez Maxes are they carry one million barrels of oil uh, versus the VLCCs that carry two. So they're not quite the perfect storage play, but they're almost they're right up there. I mean a million barrels is a lot. The other half of their fleet is MRs which are medium range product tankers that carry gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, that sort of thing. MR rates are also going ballistic because we have an enormous oversupply of jet fuel and whatnot. So point being Diamond S, it's not talked about very much, but they're doing very well in this market. Our bullish upside in their case is 178%. Our baseline upside is 93%. And our stress test, I mean, I'm talking about like worst case scenario, is still 29% upside. It's remarkable. So the average of those three, and this isn't even something I, I encourage folks. Our motto is we research, you decide. 
So I give folks the models. They can actually come onto our platform, use our analytics, plug in their own assumptions, and our market and our models will show them what the company is actually worth. And I'm talking like real time intrinsic, like net asset value. I'm not, I'm not talking like some made up multiple, right? So they can come in and do all this stuff. The average is 100% upside, like across the entire scenario. Uh, Euronav is another one we're long, stock symbol EURN. Uh, across the scenarios, the average upside is 53%. 95% upside bullish, 50% baseline, and 15% stress test. And the third one is International Seaways, uh, stock symbol INSW, 92% bullish, 49% baseline upside, 11% stress test. So that was a 50% average. And look, the bullish scenario that we ran, it's not even really that ridiculously bullish. Uh, the average VLCC rate that we use is 120. Uh, the average Suez Max rate is 80. And right now we're printing VLCC rates in the 200s and Suez Max is uh, over 100. So these are not, uh, I, I don't even do a scenario, uh, Marius, that is like balls to the walls, crazy, bullish, right? I just don't do that because I don't want folks to get too excited. It's, it's never good to like bring someone in and be like five times upside and then they get like pissed off if it's only a two bagger. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, w when it comes to the, uh, the storage, uh, obviously at first, the oversupply was going uh, to the land storage. And as we've all been reading over the last couple of days, that's pretty much full. So now more and more of it is, is going on the ships. Um, do, do you have a like a percentage or number that you think, like what percentage of fleet could actually end up being um, uh, going for storage? Yeah, you know, that's it's important to watch, and the estimates are all over the place. So we'll, we'll start off with that. Uh, first of all, we'll start off with the current numbers as well. So right now, there's a little over 150 vessels uh, that are estimated to be doing floating storage. Uh, there's a chart that we look at. It's called Oil on Water. And uh, Kepler Oil is, is, the per, is the company that puts out this chart. And they've shown the average oil on water metric for the past three to four years. It's kind of a, like in a band, right? And then they show the current oil on water. And we're basically 250 million barrels above the average. And what I like about oil on water, as opposed to just saying floating storage, is storage comes in all different forms, right? It's not always just filling up a tanker and then just sits off in the harbor. Sometimes floating storage, it's almost like hidden floating storage, is when you take a normal route that say, um, let's say from like Brazil to China, that's like about 45 days each way. Instead of just going 45 days Brazil to China, maybe that ship takes three months and just like ambles its way slowly across the oceans and like really deedle, uh, you know, dawdles around and it takes like three months to get there. So it's almost just like it's almost like storage, but it doesn't show up because the ship doesn't say, hey, I'm doing floating storage. Right. They say oh, I'm doing a normal route, but they go really slow. So that oil on water metric is how you sort of like sort out the noise. So right now we're at 250 million barrels, according to Kepler Oil. That's about that's sort of about 150 different vessels are what's storing that 250 million barrels. And, and my sort of round number, I like to use round numbers and, and, and not get too far into the weeds, but my, my sort of target is about 500 million uh, barrels of oil and water. I think that's probably what we're going to that, – that's my benchmark. I think if we get to 500 or higher, uh, that is going to be extremely bullish for the market. Um, I think if we stay at 250, it's going to be you know strong. But I, but I think 500 is the number that I'm shooting for and looking for. And then so what would have to happen – uh, after things start going to normal in order to like work that off it, it will take some time you right you can't just all of a sudden uh, the Sa Sa Saudis and the Russians are not gonna say oh we're gonna stop producing for for four months so you can work off that excess yeah what's, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a big decline and it's gonna start in in May right because that's when the OPEC cuts kick in there's gonna be a big decline in export volumes Right out of Saudi Arabia, out of Iran, Iraq, and so on. And those export volumes that are declining are going to reduce the demand for transportation of oil. Right, So that's negative for oil tankers. Mm -hmm. However, that's going to be offset, as we've been talking about, by the storage. And the storage is going to continue increasing. So that's why that sort of 500 I – mean, again, I'm using round numbers, uh, getting into the weeds too much. But that 500 you know, million barrels on water is, is sort of my estimate, my benchmark for what we need to see to maintain that bullish balance. If we get 500 or higher, that will more than offset all of the export declines that are coming from Saudi Arabia. And you're absolutely right, Marius. It's going to take a very, very, very long time to work off that inventory. And I, I think that's one thing that some of the oil bulls might be missing is that, look, we're going to have 3 billion barrels or more of global storage. That's going to take a very, very long time to work through. I mean, a normal, normally when you say the oil market is in like shortfall and say when, when the oil was like 80 bucks 
uh, maybe a year ago or so, we were like in a one million barrel per day shortfall, right, Marius? And that was like that was like very bullish for mm-hmm, oil. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have three billion barrels of storage to work off, and you're drawing it down at one million per day. I mean, that's 3,000 days. That's almost a decade. You know, it's like eight years. So, I mean, it's going to take a very long time to work that oil down. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's very helpful to to have that in perspective. Uh, well, uh, Jay, um, I don't have any more questions. So if you have any, um, you know, concluding remarks, please do so. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on your show, Marius. I would ask folks, we do have a free trial available if you're interested in checking out our research. Our, our website, we're available on Seeking Alpha, or you can go mintsmeyer.com. That's M-I-N-T-Z-M-Y-E-R.com. We have two-week free trials available. Uh, you know, Come on, check our platform out, look at some of our earnings reports and coverage of the sectors, and, and make up your own decision. Right? That's our motto. We research, you decide. Um, and, and make up your own decision and see what you think about the sector. I personally am long those three names I mentioned, uh, Diamond S, DSSI, uh, Euronav, EURN, International Seaways, INSW, and about 15 other names across the various shipping spaces. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jay, for uh, for breaking it down for us. You're welcome, Marius. Thanks.